Hello, this tutorial is entitled Individual and Population Dose Response – General Principles. The full title would be Individual and Population Dose Response and the Consequences for Drug Development and Regulatory Approval. There is a clear difference between Individual and Population Dose Response and in this tutorial we're going to go into and discuss what that means. In all therapeutic areas we would want to be able to accurately determine the individual dose responses However, in most therapeutic areas, it is generally only possible to accurately determine the population dose response. When only the population dose response is obtained, the approval process needs to plan to approve multiple dose levels. In earlier tutorials, I've shown graphs like this. And this is the dose response, but what we're talking about here is a population dose response. The idea here is, is that as we go across the dose range, we see an increase in effect and we present that as a median prediction or mean prediction and the 95% prediction interval for each dose. When we're talking at the population level, we're quantifying the average effect across individuals. For example, the average effect at 8 milligrams is 0.48 here. However, the true effect could be similar across individuals. So we could imagine that as we look at 10 individuals here, we see that the average effect is 0.48. Perhaps we would measure these with error, but the true effect perhaps could be the same for every individual. Or it could be dissimilar across individuals. So from a population dose response, we really don't know. So in this second scenario here, only patient one is having a very large gain and all the other patients are having no gain whatsoever, and still we end up with an estimate of 0.48 as the average response. So when we present these type of graphs, we're presenting the average effect here minus 0.48 and the uncertainty around that, but this doesn't tell us anything about individuals. So what are individual dose responses? Here is an example of 100 individual dose responses which are very similar. So here, there is 100 purple curves here representing an individual. So this is one individual, here is another individual. The way these curves have been generated is just shown over here. We have a maximum effect which is around 1, an ED50 which is around 10, and the steepness here, the hill coefficient, is 2. The reason these curves look quite similar is the inter-individual variability in these parameters is less than 15%. So what that means is a lot of patients all have similar levels of Emax, similar ED50s and similar heel coefficients. And therefore the curves look similar. Also shown in green here is the average of these curves. So if I just got these individuals at this dose, the, I could estimate the average effect across individuals. And that's the green line here. Here is another set of individual dose responses. So now we have 100 curves again for our 100 individuals, but the curves look very different. There's much greater heterogeneity in the dose responses. So here we're using the same population parameters, but all I've changed now is the individual variability is now 30 to 50% for each of those drug parameters. And again, we can estimate the average effect across the dose range at a particular dose. So here at 64, it's the average again of the 100 individual curves at 64 milligrams. And finally, here is another set of individual dose responses. Now the individual curves are even more heterogeneous. In this third example, I've actually created it using three subpopulations. So we have one group of individuals who have a low ED50 of around four, in, shown in the light blue. In the red, they have an ED50 of around 10 and the third group have an ED50 of around 25. And again, there's a variability between individuals in these parameters. And again, we can construct the average curve here if we only observe these at a particular dose level. The major problem we face is under these three very different individual curves, individual scenarios. So from this one here where all the patients looked very similar to here where they looked quite different, to here where they looked very different, the average curves look very similar. So they're shown here now as the, the red curve, the green curve, and the blue curve 
and they're nearly all superimposed on each other. In most clinical studies, we typically only observe data at a single dose level per individual, hence just one point from one curve. So for example, if we're running a 12-week study or a 26-week study in therapeutic areas like schizophrenia or rheumatoid arthritis, the endpoints we might be looking at might be the PAN score or the DAS28 or the ACR20, the psoriasis score, the PASI score. We're only going to get these individuals at one dose level. So for example, at 16 milligrams, this individual got 16 milligrams. He didn't also get eight or four, he only got 16. So if the PK and or the PD responses are changing slowly, and we wanna see the effect after 26 weeks or after 12 weeks, it's gonna be very difficult to investigate multiple doses within an individual. And here I also mentioned with replication because each of these values is going to be measured with error. So to understand this, even at 16 milligrams, we may believe that there is a true value for each individual, but actually when we run the study and we give the drug at 16 milligrams for this individual, the response we observe won't be exactly the same as this value here that we might think is the true value. So this point over here now is being shown on this graph as the true value. But if we add in the types of variability that we might see on this clinical endpoint, we see that this individual actually may have given a response more like two rather than perhaps one and a half. And this individual down here who really isn't responding at all actually shouldn't be giving a very impressive result, but their observed result may be very positive. And similarly, we see some individuals going the other way. So some of these individuals here are gonna look like they're improving a lot and some are gonna look like they're getting worse. And here the variability that I've put in is actually very, very small compared to the types of variability we see in these endpoints. These endpoints are typically extremely noisy. So this could be going very much up here or down here. And we're interested really in these individual curves. But we could use that individual data at each dose so this is essentially as a parallel group design, and we could estimate for the individuals who got 64, what the average effect is in a 95% confidence interval, all the way down through eight and down to one. And we could estimate the point estimate and the uncertainty. Or we could determine a predicted population dose response. So this is what we were showing earlier, this type of graph, where now we're linking across the doses with a dose response model, and we're trying to estimate the effect using all of the data, not just the data at each individual dose. However, when we have this population dose response, we can't go backwards. We can't say what was the distribution of the individual dose responses that generated that population dose response. So we could imagine if the company looked at this result, and said, well, we think everyone needs to get 16 milligrams. If we think about this scenario where there was three subpopulations, uh, actually 16 milligrams is gonna be significantly overdosing for these individuals, the low ED50 here of around four. Going up to 16, there's no need to go up to 16 in these individuals. They're already giving a very good response at doses of four and eight. And perhaps 16 is still suboptimal in terms of the third subpopulation here. Or indeed, perhaps 16 milligrams is reasonable. So here, if all the individual dose response curves actually are quite similar, 16 milligrams may be a very good dose to get a substantially large effect that perhaps is also reasonably safe. Therapeutic area knowledge and pharmacology tell us that individual patients are heterogeneous. A great place to look is to look at an anesthesiology. Uh, here we're looking at the distribution of doses required for an anaesthetic agent across 2,006 individuals. And what we see is, is that the amount of drug needed for some individuals is very different from the amount of drug needed for other individuals. The idea that we would all need the same amount of anaesthetic agents is misguided. We are different. Thus there are two choices in drug development. Here's choice number one, 
is that we accept that only the population dose response for numerous efficacy and safety endpoints are obtainable. So the regulators and drug companies should look to support multiple dose levels to allow individual dose titration, just as we would with our anaesthetic agents, where the anaesthetist is looking to titrate to the effect. The regulators and drug companies need to determine a minimum dose, so a dose which may be efficacious in some individuals, has an excellent safety profile, through to a maximum dose, and the dose which, at the population level, we would not wish to go beyond. So that safety profile is just too concerning. So if we saw adverse events across a, a thousand individuals and the rate of those adverse events was sufficiently high, that would define our maximum uh, dose that we would be prepared that patients could be titrated up to. If we've done that job, we've actually identified the dose range for regulatory approval. So we've now got the minimum dose where we think some patients could be responding through to a maximum dose which essentially is a limiting dose that we wouldn't want our patients to be exposed beyond. Between those two doses, the physician can titrate the dose level to achieve a certain pharmacodynamic response. So in the, the hypothetical example we showed earlier, an ideal dose range could be 4 milligrams through to 16 milligrams. So here we see that at 4 milligrams, even though at the population level it looks like there's only a small effect, actually there could be a lot of individuals here where 4 milligrams would be giving a very uh, good effect. Through perhaps the 16, if 16 was the maximum effect, it would still be suboptimal for a large chunk of the population perhaps, but still capturing a lot of the right dose levels for these individuals in the light blue and the, and the red here. We could actually look at the distribution of doses to achieve 80% of the effect across those uh, three subpopulations. So here's subpopulation one, here's subpopulation two, and here's subpopulation three. So these had the, the low ED50, this was the mid ED50, and this was the high ED50. And here is the distribution across all of the individuals. And it's shown here in white as the background on each of these plots. This is the same white background. And here what we see is that there's a very wide range, all the way down from doses of 2.5, 2.6, all the way up to 70 would be required. So we can think about this first subpopulation actually being very well treated by starting down at the, the 4, because the median dose that they would need to go to here is about 5.5. So it's in the right ballpark immediately with a dose of 4, even though at the population level that curve perhaps didn't look too impressive. And through up here, where actually most of these patients actually would require doses beyond 16 to be having an effect. So they're not actually going to be treated very well, um, even at the top dose. We talked about choice number one, which is when we only have the population level information. Choice number two would be to look, can we design studies that will accurately and precisely capture individual dose responses? So we need to investigate the ability to meaningfully estimate individual dose responses within your therapeutic area. So we can think about novel study designs with better analysis methods. So for example, we can investigate a large dose range within individuals, for example, a crossover type design with shorter treatment durations. So before I talked about studies where we often have 26 weeks of treatment at just one dose level. Or perhaps we could think about giving individuals a range of doses for just four weeks and looking at the distribution of responses across the dose range within an individual. We can also think about forced titration studies. So for example, patients starting at a low dose and then every four weeks being ramped up. Or for example, they could start at a high dose and come down. The important thing to understand would be the, the consequence of the longitudinal effect of the response and the effect of the dose. We need to separate out those two parts. A comment here is, is that I'm really not a fan of the flexible or response adaptive titrations. So the idea there would be that you often, sometimes you will see studies there where individuals start at the low dose and if they're not achieving a particular response, they're titrated upwards. Now that's fine for clinical practice, and that's naturally maybe what you want to do in clinical practice. But in terms of generating useful data 
what happens there is, is that the, the patients who go on to the higher doses are the ones who are hardest to treat. So when you get the data back, you can't just presume that they're a random sample of individuals who are receiving the higher dose. Actually, they're only receiving the higher dose because they were not responding to the lower dose. So they're self-selecting themselves. And that's not ideal when you try to do the modeling subsequently. And the third thing here would be exposure response longitudinal modeling. So using the different exposures data. So as the study is going through, the patient's uh, pharmacokinetics is changing. So perhaps using that changing pharmacokinetic information plus the longitudinal aspect of the data to try to understand how individual dose responses may look like. The final thing would be to look at perhaps surrogates, biomarkers rather than the clinical endpoints. So when we have endpoints like the schizophrenia endpoint of PANS, it's very, very difficult to get nice resolution on the quality of that endpoint. But perhaps in your therapeutic area, there could be other surrogates or biomarkers where you could look at the individual dose response on the biomarkers as a stepping stone between trying to understand what dose range to approve. For the modelers out there, simply fitting the ideal model to the available data could result in absolute rubbish. So it's important to understand that even though we can write down the model that we would like to estimate, we need to make sure that the data is capable of reliably estimating those parameters. So the IIVs, the inter-individual variabilities on Emacs and ED50, we need to make sure that our data is strong enough to estimate them. So for example, it could be looking when you're doing exposure response modeling, when you have a limited exposure range per individual. So the exposures actually are not covering a very wide range within an individual. Or for example, dose response modeling, if there's just a single dose level per individual. Or response titrated designs. So what we were talking about before was where the dose range is conditional on the outcomes. So it yields a non-random imbalance in the data. Only the, the sickest patients perhaps go to the highest doses. And then trying to use that type of information to construct accurate and sound estimates of the IIVs, the individual variabilities, is going to be very challenging because you're getting skewed data. So as a summary, to recognize the difference between individual and population dose response and design, analyze, interpret and approve accordingly. Requires multiple dose levels be studied in phase three because we're trying to understand the dose response still across the dose range for both efficacy and safety. And with that information, a dose range can be approved rather than perhaps a single dose level. It's important to recognize that the population dose responses tell us nothing about the individual dose responses. So I've shown that we can have the same population level dose response, but the individual dose responses can look very different. And if we don't understand that, it's very difficult to try to understand what dose levels should be approved. I think it's important to determine whether individual dose responses could be determined in your therapeutic area, perhaps on biomarkers or perhaps on surrogate endpoints. And finally, for the modelers, only fit that perfect individual dose response models when you're sure that the data is able to support such models to get accurate and precise estimates of those important parameters. And an easy way to do that is to use clinical trial simulation to design and evaluate the study. I hope you found this video interesting. If so, you may want to check out our other videos. If you have any comments or suggestions, please feel free to contact me.